from Microbe TV, this is TWIP, This Week in Parasitism, episode 104, recorded on February 25th, 2016. Hi, everybody. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and joining me here in New York City, Dixon de Pommier. Hello, Vincent. And Daniel Griffin. Hello, Hello Daniel. everybody. <laughs> <laughs> you stop that. <laughs> Just stop it. <laughs> stop that. Also joining us on a return visit from Montreal, Canada, McGill University, Michael Libman. Welcome back. Thanks very much for having me back. <laughs> <laughs> you could be called away at any moment for an emergency, right? Yeah, absolutely. How does that go? <laughs> code, code red or something like that? Code brown, that's code, the worst. Code brown. That's <laughs> What's brown? <laughs> it's a parasite show. Come on. We we have we have young children listening. Okay. <laughs> stat what is what does stat mean when they when they say stat? Now, right away? Right, right away. Right away. Now. Right away. All right. Well Michael is here because he gave us this um puzzling case. Last time, and maybe um, Daniel, since you have the notes in front of you, you could summarize it, right? And uh, Dr. Lipman, you jump in if I summarize this improperly, but these are Vincent's notes. Um, and to re- <laughs> to remind our listeners, or for those that are tuning in for the first time, last episode we learned about a 42 year old male refugee who had come to Canada from the Democratic Republic of the Congo, which is formerly Zaire. Um, and there's a sort of unending civil war, and this was a person who had to leave there. Uh, He's upper middle class professor of French at a university. He was, I guess, on the wrong side of some authority figures. He was in prison. There was, unfortunately, some torture, Um, and then he had to flee and live in the jungle for many years, uh, finally reaching a refugee camp in Tanzania. From the refugee camp in Tanzania, he was given asylum, my understanding, and moved to Canada. Um, there was one mention, I don't know if it's in the notes, but apparently there was some, he hurt his leg, there was some kind of a wound at some point during the jungle time, which might be relevant. Um, he came to the health system about 15 months after his arrival in Canada, and was actually sent to psychiatry, uh, because his problems uh, seemed to be... Uh, such with unstable emotions, delusions, hallucinations, depression, post-traumatic issues, um, and a lot of just fatigue, sleepiness. Uh, He was under the psychiatric care for about a year, not improving, actually getting worse, and was sent to the hospital for medical evaluation. And as mentioned in his history, he had talked about this minor injury. He had hurt his lower back, um, with some pain there that was bothering him. He had a little bit of anemia, so a decrease in his blood cells. Uh, his basic uh, labs otherwise were not particularly remarkable, and his physical exam was also not particularly remarkable. We did learn that he was HIV negative, and he did some have some evidence for a chronic inflammatory condition with a elevated sedimentation rate. It's a measure of chronic inflammation or inflammation at all, and that was elevated um, at a number of 60 Uh, He had a diffuse increase in antibodies, elevated IgG and IgM. And he also uh, was noted to have low level of autoantibodies. We were told that he had anti-nuclear antibodies, uh, uh, P-ANCA, anti-neutrophil cytoplasmic antibodies, so C-ANCA. Slightly elevated fever for a few days. um, And then he'd gone a period of time without fever. Uh, He did not have any eosinophil, so no eosinophilia. As far as radiology, he did have a CT with some mediastinal, aortic, axillary, lymphadenopathy. And uh, there was discussion. He was probably screened in Africa for malaria, perhaps treated. Probably also got a number of um, medications before he left Africa, possibly ivermectin or albendazole. We also learned that he got a head MRI, which was not completely normal, but showed nonspecific midbrain abnormality, some mild diffuse edema. He did have a loss of weight, but no visual problems. Did we leave anything out, Michael? Uh, and that he had an LP. He had a lumbar puncture done. Oh, yeah. um, Results uh, of which we don't know yet. 
Okay. <laughs> <laughs> that would give it away, I suppose. No, not completely. No? I think okay. I asked about that. Actually, I think time. we did we get a little bit of results? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. A few cells and some some protein. That, that right, exactly right. So there, there were. So it was, it was, it was certainly not normal. There was, um, let me find it here. There was about um, uh, two hundred cells uh, that were mostly lymphocytic, and the protein was moderately elevated. So there was essentially a sign of some kind of inflammatory problem going on that was reflected in his uh, lumbar. All right, we have some guesses from our listeners. The first one is from Hugo. Victor Hugo. No, just Hugo. <laughs> I will venture into a guess given that I am a TWIP trained electronics engineer. <laughs> Excellent. I, I grew up in Venezuela where I contracted Ascaris lumbricoides, head lice, amoebiasis, and even cutaneous larva migraines from playing in a sand pile contaminated with cat feces. I cannot believe that I, growing as a middle-class boy in Venezuela, had more parasites than the patient who was a refugee from Africa and had a dramatic journey. I can only suppose he had been been given a course of albendazole at some point, and so my guess would be neurocystosarcosis. Hmm. After the cyst is killed by albendazole, the inflammatory reaction sets in and would be consistent with the neurological symptoms. He would have ingested the eggs of tinea solium at some point in his journey, Probably from soil contaminated by a pig farm. All right. Uh, Daniel, you want to take the next one? Sure. How, how do we pronounce that? Yosef? Yosef. Yosef. Yosef writes, Dear Twip, Twip, and Twippy, <laughs> for my main guess, I'd like to go with African trypanosomiasis caused by Trypanosoma brucei gabiense. This nasty critter can be obtained from the bite of a tsetse fly, which is endemic to Central and Western Africa. The trypomastigotes then spread throughout the body, including the lymph nodes, which leads to the lymphadenopathy, and divide by binary fission. The offspring sometimes have differing surface glycoproteins. As a result, your immune system makes IgM and IgG for whatever is prominent initially. But a few trypomastigotes survive the onslaught and repopulate, leading to the recurrent fever. You are left with a chronic infection where you make tons of different antibodies, desperately seeking to eradicate this unwelcome pest, which leads to the elevated ESR and antibodies. The constant battle between your immune system and this foreign invader releases tons of cytokines, which would lead to an anemia of chronic disease, which would be normochromic and microcytic. I would get a blood smear to confirm this diagnosis. My alternative diagnoses are Trypanosoma brucei rodiense, very unlikely due to the fact that it is usually fatal within a few months, while Gambiense can result in a chronic infection. Plasmodium falciparum would be a nice trick since we just had a twip on cerebral malaria. It fits somewhat well, the relapsing fevers and neurological symptoms, but would most likely have been checked for before he got to Canada. Toxoplasmosis. The patient is HIV negative, but I don't recall a white count. It is unlikely that immunodeficiency would be missed, and Toxo has a pretty distinct lesion on MRI. Neurocystosarcosis. I would consider him lucky if he was able to find a pig to eat while running away. <laughs> Unfortunately, almost nothing fits with this diagnosis except the neurological involvement. Thank you for all the good work, and I hope that this patient did well. Sincerely, Yosef Davidoff, MD candidate at Hofstra Northwell School of Medicine 2018. Nice. Out your way, right? Actually, that's I was spent about eight years out there at yeah. the what's now become the Northwell Health System. It used to be North Shore LIJ, ah. and they oh. just renamed themselves, and they, they had a Super Bowl ad so that everybody would know. Oh. So Hofstra must have merged with them at some so point. So what happened, right? initially there were two hospitals, a little background, North Shore LIJ. They merged yeah. about a decade ago, and then it grew into this 21-hospital healthcare system. Mm -hmm. Then... Um, I think it was about four years ago, they got permission to start a medical school. So oh. they actually created a relationship with Hofstra, and it's now Hofstra mm -hmm. North Shore LIJ, or I guess Hofstra Northwell School yeah. of Medicine. Okay. So, yeah. How many years of medical classes have they had? Do you know, roughly? I think it's only three or four sure. years. I th actually think, what was it? Either this spring or last spring was the first oh. graduating class, a very new school of medicine. Daniel, you should be the dean there. <laughs> exactly. 
And you could just I am walk. done. I am done with administration. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> Even a local medical I like school? I like being in the drenches. How far do you live from there? Ten minutes? Um, you know, when I it was great. When I was actually at North Shore, I used to joke that it was a fifteen minute commute if there was a line at Starbucks on my way yeah. into work. <laughs> no, three miles, three miles from that place. Uh, hey Dixon. Okay. Uh, David writes. No, 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 no. You skipped. Uh, I'm one. sorry, Doctor Wink. <clears throat> doctor, you gave me the long one. Okay, fine. I'll take that. Doctor Wink writes. Re loop African expatriate. Loopy. Loop. There's only loop. Loop African. Loopy. Loopy. Regarding loopy African expatriate. Why would you say loop? <laughs> reads, it reads loop online. Well, I don't you know about yours. You haven't refreshed your. I'm not sure. Right. Loopy is an acknowledged technical term. Okay. Well. <laughs> Okay, loop or loopy ask, African I was going to ask you guys that. <laughs> uh, he writes, uh, I'm guessing TB uh, Gambiense infection, West African sleeping sickness, eh? <laughs> Did you Wait. get that, Michael, eh? 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 He, uh, oh, a, a, a as in E-H. Yes, yeah. right. That's right. It's, 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 uh, isn't that something said a lot in so Canada? Your, your accent was off there, so I couldn't recognize it. <laughs> Everything yeah, I this, just said uh, was off. <laughs> he wrote it just for you, Michael. So Dr. Wink <laughs> is a physician in, in Atlanta who always writes in and participates in these. Yeah. Now, how, what's the right way to say it, Michael? A? 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 You have to keep it short. Okay. Uh, Dixon. Yes? Would you like to take the long one? Sure. Uh, dear Twip Trio and guests, <clears throat> after doing some serious internet research and discussion with my parasitologically literate girlfriend, Megan, we would like to hazard a guess to the case of the refugee from the Democratic Republic of the Congo. We believe he has contracted a case of African trypanosomiasis, a.k.a. sleeping sickness, caused by a trypanosoma brucei species, most likely T. brucei or T. Bruce, as they put it here, but it's actually Brucei Gambianzi. We have come to this conclusion for a multitude of reasons. One, no eosinophilia in T. Brucei infections. Two, on and off fever, anemia are typical symptoms. Three, the patient had an erratic sleep cycle. Four, the mental symptoms, mood swings, depression, hallucinations, delusions, are symptoms of this parasite, but also exacerbated due to stress PTSD. Five, <clears throat> more than 80% of sleeping sickness cases originate in the DRC. Six, there is evidence of autoantibody formation with African trypanosomiasis. Seven, the one to three year incubation period is consistent with that of African trypanosomiasis. Eight, the enlarged axillary slash inguinal lymph nodes, or winter bottoms sign in the neck, <clears throat> which we didn't hear about, are suggestive <laughs> of cerebral infection due to African trypanosomiasis. Nine, the malaria drugs, as well as the ivermectin, should be ineffective against trypanosoma brucei. And finally, ten, the lower back pain might be the bite zone for the tsetse fly, or the parasite itself in the spinal cord. Performing a lumbar puncture to collect cerebrospinal fluid should reveal trypanosomiasis. Treatment should include IV eflornithine and slash or nifurtimox to cure second stage infection, while first stage infection can be cured with bentamidine. Thank you once again for your many informative podcasts. Best, Dave P. Hmm. Those are, that's a wonderful diagnosis, by the way, even if it's wrong. Oh, it might not be. You never know. <laughs> Hillary writes, hello, I'm a TWIP educated parasitology hobbyist. I have a bachelor's degree in chemistry and I hope to apply for an MD-PhD program in August in immunology. Mm. My guess is TB gambiense or possibly another subspecies in the trypanosoma brucei species, e.g. TB rodiense. I think the man or his central nervous system most of the time is a great reservoir for trypomastigotes. Ivermectin is known to have difficulty crossing the blood-brain barrier, especially in mammals, so it isn't likely ivermectin treated the advanced stage West African sleeping sickness in his brain. The periodic fever is a manifestation of the life cycle of the parasites and the patient's immune response to the parasite. Periodically, the, tri the trypanosomes in his brain, I suppose, reach a certain parasitic load so as to break free of the brain cells where it is safe from antibodies and macrophages and the like. His body would appear to have developed an immune response to trypanosomes circulating in his bloodstream. If these parasites somehow result in more oxygen-free radicals in his blood and anemia, then the P. anca antibodies his neutrophils are synthesizing are in response to this elevated oxygen-free radical concentration. 
To find out, you could examine CSF under a microscope or his blood shortly before he experienced a fever, although I'm not sure how you would anticipate it. <laughs> That's right. Or you could treat with melaros- mel- melarsoprol and see if that helps or not. How did I do? <laughs> what did you all think? Thank you for your podcast. <laughs> right. Yeah, all right. Well, I'm glad Hillary listens. I don't know if Bernie or Trump listen to our uh, podcast, but we'll have to see. Elise writes, Dear Twip Trifecta, here I am, and many apologies for being a wall for Twip 102. The long march of spring school holidays is upon me, severely cramping my style. <laughs> I hope this finds you well. The yo-yoing weather finds it pretty warm today in lower Manhattan, currently 52 degrees Fahrenheit, 11 degrees C. It is remarkable, first of all, that your guest, Dr. Libman's patient, managed to survive to the point where he would have to deal with parasites and how horrible, on the other side, to be brought so low by one after making it through so much. We don't know the outcome, but I do hope he managed to get some relief. My guess at a diagnosis for the 42-year-old patient originally from the Democratic Republic of the Congo is that he is harboring Trypanosome brucei gambiense and is suffering from West African trypanosomiasis. The symptoms of West African trypanosomiasis are very similar to those that the patient experiences. Substantial cognitive problems including depression and psychosis, highly disordered sleep patterns and exhaustion, intermittent fever, and some anemia. West African trypanosomiasis can also take an extended period of time, years, to make itself manifest. Unlike the East African form of the disease, which progresses extremely quickly, this parasite has complicated and shifting methods to getting around the human immune system, which may account for some of the cyclical aspects of the patient's symptoms, in addition to the parasite being so hidden for so long. The slow progress of the disease explains why the patient's problems were thought initially to be more psychiatric in origin. One clue we weren't offered is that the gentleman had an injury to his back, though we don't know what sort of injury it was. Is it possible that this injury was the wound from the tsetse fly bite? I've seen many descriptions of these bites as being very painful, and if he was bitten while he was in hiding, it could easily have gotten infected. I am, of course, very interested to hear what exactly the patient's lumbar puncture revealed. I've read about a very similar case in which a young woman arrived in the Netherlands from Angola with very similar symptoms, and a definitive diagnosis was only able to be made after at least two lumbar punctures. Like the patient, her scans revealed somewhat vague abnormalities. I did look into other parasitic infections of the central nervous system, but trypanosomiasis seemed like the best fit. One thing I was wondering is whether the patient's life of extreme stress and near starvation before he arrived in Canada may have slowed the progress of the disease, so that it wasn't until he arrived in a safe place that he recovered enough for the disease to really hit its stride. As always, I look forward so much to your podcast. Thank you so much for everything, and all best wishes. All right, last one from you, Dixon. Jim writes, respected professors, hmm. <clears throat> I'm going to go for schistosomiasis for the 42-year-old man who was forced to live in the jungle of DRC. <clears throat> I will go further and say that S. Mansoni, with a nod to S. Guineensis, which is a new one for me. That's for me, too, I think. I encountered S. Japonicum as a medical officer in the U.S. Navy. A rectal biopsy showed an incidental finding of S. Japonicum, mostly calcified eggs in a man who was a prisoner of war in, uh, during the Second World War in the Pacific. Schistosomiasis was not a clinical issue. That finding stimulated a short term of research in schistosomiasis and its interaction with viral hepatitis. I still remember the mice waiting to have their tails dipped into the water tank housing the infected snails. At that time, the U.S. Navy had a medical research unit in Egypt. Uh, That was a different era. I have one question related to the lady from India with a gynecocosis, probably from dog exposure. I am a dog person and unabashedly anthropomorphizer. I had an acquaintance who is into the current fashion of feeding dogs only raw meat of uncertain origin. I would think that that is a risk for a gynecocosis infection in the dog and pet owner. This meat is sold by some pet suppliers. What is your opinion? Weather in Alabama is windy, 11 degrees C, after 3.5 inches of rain and tornado warnings last night. Keep up the good work, Jim. Well, right now it's 9 degrees in uh, New York after a torrential rainstorm yesterday, right? We had a lot of weather. Whoa, overnight. What do you you think of feeding dogs this raw meat? No good? 
It's not the meat that they feed the dogs that gives them the conococcus. It's the cysts from the livers usually that gives them the, mm-hmm. um, the infection. So the meat itself would not contain the stages that you'd be free to give them. Liver only. I wouldn't say liver only, but mostly. Right. Sometimes it's in the perineal cavity of the, of the animals as well, but it's usually not in meat. Raw meat of uncertain origin. I like that. Yeah. <laughs> Fortunately, they often just sort of the whole viscera in there, okay. these cysts. Yeah. All right, so we have a number of different guests as we have. We do. We have schistosomes. We have a couple of TB gambienses. Yep. We have a neurocystosarcosis. Right. And uh, I think that's it. We're pl- uh, yeah, that's about it, right? We got, uh, uh, we're leaning towards one. What did you think of those, Michael? Yeah, listen, I thought those were uh, great discussions. Uh, there's, there was a couple of, I think it was the second one, was certainly quite a, it was the, it was the, Still a medical student yep. waiting to graduate. I think. <laughs> That's right. Who, who, who gave a who gave a very uh, complete list and, um, and a nice uh, differential there. So I certainly hope he graduates. Uh, <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, and um, and uh, I, I think a lot of the points that I would have brought up were uh, were brought up by these discussants. So um, uh, well, I guess I, in particular, I think some of the <clears throat> a couple of things were brought. I think one of them also mentioned. Uh, malaria as a part of the differential, although um, dis- dismissed it. And I mean, I-, I basically agree with the discussions that were brought up there. Uh, n- malaria, of course, there is cerebral malaria, but that's generally an acute type of disease, an acute, relatively fulminant type of disease. You wouldn't expect it to give such a long uh, type of uh, indolent course. Yeah, uh, I agree. A- and-, and as we mentioned, uh, um, I think I mentioned that, in fact, all of these refugees were actually all um, given anti-malarial treatment. There were so many that were found to be positive for malaria sure. before even getting on the plane over that, in fact, they were all treated for malaria before they came over. So that I'm not possible that he could still bring back malaria with him, but it, that, that one didn't really fit. Uh, it, it was also mentioned, a sister cirrhosis was mentioned, neurosister yes, cirrhosis. That's right. And, um, but I agree also, neurosister cirrhosis can like a lot of parasitic diseases i think because it's um it's focal the, the a, lo- a lot of parasites that make their way into the head give a, 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 a they're, they're they're relatively large organisms so that uh not only when you do your scanning and your imaging you land up seeing rather than in this case which was a diffuse very non-specific kind of abnormality you actually land up seeing something you see an object and the the trick can sometimes be to figure out what that object might be but you do see a a, what we call a mass lesion somewhere Uh, and that would be the case normally with neurosister psychosis you would find one or more mass lesions which which we didn't uh, which we didn't see on his MRI so the the I won't say that the Clinical picture is in, in maybe atypical, but really the MRI that that failed to show any masses would make uh, sister cirrhosis unlikely, neurosister cirrhosis. Mm-hmm. And similarly, uh, somebody also mentioned cerebral toxoplasmosis, which I would make much the same argument. Uh, I think he, in fact, did mention that neurotoxoplasmosis is mostly a disease of the immune compromise, and in fact. For reasons that I'm not sure I completely understand, it's a disease largely of, of advanced HIV disease. Um, we, we don't even see neuro, neurologic disease from toxoplasma very much in people who have other types of immune suppression. Mm. But once again, the diagnosis is largely on the imaging of the brain because you the, the toxoplasma, the toxoplasma itself is microscopic, but the lesion that it causes in the brain is certainly something that would normally be seen on the image. And we we didn't see anything on him. And he was, as I did mention, HIV negative. Um, there, I mean, uh, it's always not fair because because <laughs> there's the, I guess, bias or, or a priori probability that diagnosis will be a parasitic <laughs> diagnosis. <laughs> exactly. But but I think people shouldn't completely leave out the possibilities that it's <laughs> in real life that it's that it's not necessarily a parasitic disease. And um, so I think a couple of things that might come into the non-parasitic differential, but still infectious, uh, could be it could include things like so. For example, if we if we would have known that he was immune suppressed, uh, or that particularly if he had HIV, uh, cryptococcal meningitis is something that can be quite indolent that can cause 
you know, altered mental status without very specific kind of findings and, uh, and can be quite an indolent but slowly progressive kind of disease. I think I would say very rare outside of the immune suppressed patient, and we we didn't find any evidence that he was uh, immune suppressed, so that would take that out. Uh, and then there's one bacterial disease that I think we sometimes tend to forget about, but the but there is a bacterial disease yeah. which, as they the the the, 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 the so called great imitator, which can cause pretty much anything, especially neurologic, and um, that would be syphilis. Right. Uh, neurosyphilis, exactly. uh, but I'll tell you that that's not the disease. <laughs> <laughs> what do you think of this guess of uh, schistosomiasis? Soma. Yeah, well, schistosomiasis uh, normally, again, would cause something visible on the scan. It, it, it's it's not common, but it does happen that schistosomes manage to. Um, a lot of schistosomal disease is actually the disease. Not of the parasite, but of the eggs. The the eggs yes. that go, the, the eggs that 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 want to actually get back out into the environment land up um, getting swept up in the circulation and landing up in the liver or other places. And they can land up in the central nervous system, especially in some cases, like in in schistosoma hematobium, they can land up in the spinal cord. Uh, sometimes eggs can land up getting into right into the brain. Uh, but sometimes also what happens peculiarly is the worms themselves, instead yes. of taking up their residence in the liver or nearby where they should land up, they, they you actually get the adults landing up in the brain. But again, whether it's the adults or whether it's the eggs causing a reaction, the scan should show that. And um, so having a scan that doesn't show a specific lesion in one specific part of the brain, I think tends to rule out many things, including something like schistosoma, schistosomiasis in the brain. Uh, so, Michael, what was the key for you to diagnose this? Well, you know, I think a lot of people, the point is this is... It, it, it's. A, I guess it's a bit of the artificial problem that we have when we present these kinds of cases. Uh, if you start with the assumption that we're presenting a parasitic disease, there aren't a lot of parasitic diseases that do this kind of thing. And I think <laughs> several of the people who wrote in did uh, seize on mm. African sleeping sickness and trypanosomiasis, and in particular, the West African variant of trypanosomiasis caused by trypa trypanosomia. Trypanosoma brucei gambiensi. Uh, they, they, uh, I think they quite rightly latched onto it as one of the few parasitic diseases that would explain uh, pretty much everything in the case description. The difficulty, I mean, listen, all those, I suggest that all of those people who wrote in, they could come and get a job in the psychiatric hospital where this guy was first assessed. <laughs> because, of course, the difficulty. Um, is that uh, they were not thinking of parasitic disease at all. Uh, and and that's, I think, he is, the reason his case is interesting to me is that he's actually uh, typical of the problem that we have. Uh, he, he People don't, m many physicians don't know about, I mean, they may have heard of sleeping sickness, but they don't really know much about it. They don't really know right. necessarily what it looks like or how to investigate it. And certainly, I don't want to, disparage psychiatrists in any way, but I would... <laughs> oh, go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> but with all due respect. <laughs> with, all, with all due respect, I would venture... Don't take this personally. <laughs> I would venture to say that the last time most psychiatrists really uh, had anything to do with this disease was perhaps on some multiple choice exam back uh. in medical school. Uh, and so it's not necessarily a surprise that it, it wasn't thought of. It, it wasn't... It, it simply wasn't thought of. And there, I think there are many cases, not many, but there's cases in the Western world where uh, these people are treated for their psychiatric, psychologic type symptoms, and it never dawns on anybody yes, that that's right. it's, forget about parasitic, it doesn't even dawn on them that it is infectious even. Yeah. Um, and uh, because everybody has the image of many infectious diseases as being really more, something a little more fast moving, something a little more virulent and destructive. Sure. You see this movie with Tom Hanks, um, he was a castaway, I believe that's the name of the movie, and mm. and he, he he befriends a coconut shell and, and personifies it so he has a companion to talk a basketball, with. A basketball, a basketball. I'm sorry, <laughs> and he was totally 
totally freaked out by the fact that he was all by himself, all alone, no matter what. This guy could have had a similar experience, you know, in the deep jungles of Africa, not knowing one minute to the next whether his life was going to be taken by some animal. Uh, he would step on a sharp object and get infected and suffer a horrible slow death. Or I mean, you know, you go through all the machinations. Every time you go to sleep, you're afraid to, to wake up for what's around the corner waiting for you. So he could have had a mental breakdown, and this could all be psychiatric related without any infectious diseases at all. Sure, sure. Uh, but but. I'm glad you mentioned that. <laughs> however, you are on a parasite show. Remember right. that. <laughs> but I, I, I'm glad you brought up this. I think cinematic history. Uh, it's one of my favorite scenes because he he names. You may remember he names the basketball Wilson. That's right. That's right. That's it's, right. it's a Wilson basketball, and there's this great scene when Wilson gets swept away by the waves, and he's yeah, basically yeah. in tears, going Wilson. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Michael, a couple of people uh, talked about. Uh, a lumbar puncture in CSF. Well, you told us uh, at the top of the show that um, you didn't find much in there. Is that true? Well, so his CSF was uh, abnormal in the sense of indicating some kind of inflammatory disorder. Yeah. But it is actually true that, of course, uh, uh, brilliant as we are, we thought of trypanosomiasis. And we did look at his CSF for trypanosomes and did not find. In fact, we we, we landed up, if I recall, uh, giving, doing three separate lumbar punctures um, and actually did not find any trypanosomes. Mm. And that is, um, but I would say that doesn't rule out the diagnosis. That's, no, that's one of the... One of the big problems with the West African, so the, and I, to me this brings up, I, I'm sure probably you've talked about this over the many shows that uh, I have to confess I'm a relatively <laughs> late comer to the to TWIP, but 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 what's the what's the difference between East African and West African trypanosomiasis? One of them is a human disease, a human reservoir, and the other is a zoonosis. Right. It's really uh, a, a disease that adapted to another animal. And animals, <laughs> and and any like any good uh, like any good parasite, um, the ones the human ones are adapted to the human and 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 try at least to some extent not to cause too much damage, mm. um, and so uh, the disease is that's why I, you know speaking from the <laughs> I'm not presuming to speak for the creator of the universe, but uh, <laughs> the the. Presumably, the reason this disease is so indolent is because the, the parasite is trying to survive as long as possible. Uh, it wants to um, reproduce itself, but only insofar as it can pass itself on. And by reproducing itself to very high numbers, as the East African variant tends to do, uh, that causes a lot more immune response and a lot more inflammation and a lot more damage and the, the demise of the host much more quickly. So a, a maladapted parasite in the case of the of the East African variant, uh, so in this case, uh, it actually is it's the classic textbook thing: hard to find those trypanosomes, and uh, and we did have a hard time. So um, I guess my question would be, what's the test that we did to make the diagnosis? Uh -huh. <laughs> I would suggest something dealing with its genome. <laughs> PCR. Yeah, and you look for the mini circles or maxi circles. And where, where would you do that? On what specimen? I would take blood. Blood. Okay. Yeah, a lot of blood. <laughs> How about we let's ask the doctor. Okay. <laughs> See, I already know this case, so I'm. Oh, I'm you knew the case. Yes, I knew the case. <laughs> would well, you so, do? Go ahead, Michael. Uh, I'll tell you that that we did such a test, but I'll tell you that we actually made the diagnosis with a little bit earlier than that with a different test. Come on, Dixon, you're the guy. Blood smear. Just keep looking. Uh, Wait. His, I, his blood smears were. <laughs> so his blood smears were. I will tell you that, of course, you can, you should, and 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 we did try and look at his blood smears as well, and and also fail to see um, any um, uh, any trypanosomes in his peripheral blood. We we did try that, um, and uh, and in fact, we also did go after uh, a couple of his lymph nodes. Where, because that's another place you can look classically. Yeah, that's right. And, that's right. Somebody mentioned winter bottom sign, which is they did. Um, it's a it's a it's one of those old you know described I presume by Professor Winterbottom. <laughs> exactly. Um, uh, 
Uh, Winter and Bottom both describe that. <laughs> actually, actually, no, I should jump in and tell who is Dr. Winter. He was actually, you know, I always have heard the story, like he was an officer, he was checking slaves. He actually was an abolitionist physician who was in Africa for about four years, and he noticed this association between hmm. the swelling and the lymph nodes and actually the back of the neck, yeah. and that a lot of patients would develop this sleepiness on the ships, um, you know, headed to the new world. So he actually was, he's not a bad guy. He was actually an <laughs> abolitionist who was um, taking care of folks in West Africa. So right. Dr. Winterbottom. So I was led to the diagnosis here by um, Dr. Griffin. He allowed me to cheat on his cheat sheet. So they did an, <laughs> a, a card agglutination test for trypanosomiasis, which apparently was positive. That's exactly true. What is that? Uh, well, it's basically a serologic test. In other words, it's you're looking simply for, for an antibody directed specifically at uh, at the trypanosome, um, and uh, it, you know, it's it's it seems like a sensible thing. We do it in infectious disease all the time to look for antibodies to whatever to help make the diagnosis. Mm. In parasitology, though, it's it's often not that useful. It, the parasites are, are 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 you know, I, I like to think of them as much more sophisticated organisms compared to things like bacteria and, and viruses. Not that they're not smart in their own it's way. Heresy. I wouldn't go any further, Michael, if you want to get back on the show next week. <laughs> The uh, but, but, the technical but, but, advisor is starting to throw uh, viral particles at us. <laughs> <laughs> well, but no, but but worms. I mean, seriously, worms. We won't talk about intelligence. We'll just talk about it's, it's a multicellular right? organism. Sure, I mean, it's a multicellular organism. They're, right? They're more evolved. They are, and, and more and more. <laughs> Yeah. All right. That's it again, for you. That's again, it. he's shaking he's, his head. Thank you, Michael. Good talking to you. <laughs> <laughs> well, they have a different set of barbed wire to na navigate. They're, they're, they're more out in the open than your viral particles because you're sequestered inside of a cell. You're, you have a no, another world in there to deal with. So it's just a different level of – not even sophistication. It's just a different level. I would say, I, but the, else. My, Michael was was talking about antibodies originally. Yeah, yeah, so yeah, we're, yeah. We're, right, right. So what I mean, right, right. We got before we got distracted. <laughs> but the right, exactly. The point is that um, in many parasitic diseases, um, it can sometimes be hard to find antibodies right. that are really uh, sensitive enough to all different strains of that particular parasite. Mm -hmm. And on the con on the other side, perhaps even a bigger problem is that uh, when you find antibodies to some parasites, there's this tendency for them to also cross-react with a lot of other sure. uh, similar parasites. And so serology, in, in many cases, hasn't been fantastically useful for it. In some parasitic disease, yes, but in many, not that Toxo is an exception, I would, ex I would assume. Yeah. But uh, as it turns out, um, it, in the in this right setting uh, of somebody who's ex in the area where the, where West African trypanosomes uh, cause a lot of disease, it turns out that the antibody test uh, is actually reasonably sensitive and specific, uh, so that they it, it picks up the great majority of cases and um, de doesn't cross react that much with m most other things. So it's what, but what's most interesting about it, of course, is that it's a very simple type of test. So this type of antibody test can be done with a little piece of cardboard and a couple of simple reagents. And you can do this, what we call a glutination test, and you can do it in the field. It doesn't require any fancy equipment or even all that much mm -hmm. training. So it's a, it's a test that can be used on the, in the field in, in Congo to uh, make this kind of diagnosis. Um, it's, a, it's a kit that was actually... Um, put together by the Belgians in the Tropical mm -hmm. Institute in Antwerp. Uh, but they make this kit available to anybody who wants it. So any lab anywhere who is um, interested in obtaining these kits, they only have to write and they can have a, they, the kits are given away for free. And they've proven very useful. I, I think you were mentioning about the slave trade and, and trypanosomiasis was actually a big problem for the Belgians yeah. who in the colonial days were not, well, <laughs> I don't want to say anything against anybody, right? But but they were not known for their kindness towards slaves. Uh, and, and yet they were very concerned about African sleeping sickness because um, it became pretty obvious that this was a big medical problem and it was eating into the profits of the slave trade. The, the right. last thing you want to do is spend all that money shipping your slaves across the ocean only to have them get sick and die on the other end. Sure. So we can ask our listeners to ask answer this uh 
this extra credit question then. <laughs> what would you be afraid of from a person that had African trypanosomiasis being brought to the new world? What would be your biggest fears in terms of introduction of parasitic infections? Would you be afraid of introducing, let's say, African trypanosomiasis? Or would you be afraid of introducing, let's say, malaria or filariasis? Because uh, we have some history with that. And so the answer could come back very surprising. All right, we'll let him answer. We will. So, Michael, the, <laughs> Michael, the, um, the test, the card test, uh, how early in this gentleman's case did you do that? How, or how long was it till you got to the point where you did that test? Uh, well, we, not long after we had the abnormal brain scan okay. and the abnormal uh, lumbar puncture, because it is a test that we happen to keep uh, we, have, we happen to keep in stock. We have it available to us largely by fluke. But we're, uh, we have a lab uh, here where they're actually very interested in the trypanosomes of monkeys. Um, wow. And uh, so we happen to have the test easily available, and we did do it um, uh, fairly early on. Although, as I said, if it ever does come up, it is a test where they'll 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 put it they'll put it in a courier envelope and send it over uh, to your lab if it's something that you need. So we did get a strong positive on that. Um, fairly early on, uh, and then that led us to uh, the idea of doing a molecular, doing a PCR uh, on his, uh, particularly on his on his uh, cerebrospinal fluid. Um, and, but the, you know the the trouble with the PCR is it's a great test, but most labs would not have a PCR set up ready to go, validated uh, to, mm. to to make this to to make this kind of diagnosis. Again, we were lucky mostly in the sense that we we had a lab that was already interested in the disease. Uh, so we had the ability relatively quickly to do uh, a CSF so analysis. Michael, in, in the U.S., there's a fallback that all of us use, and that is to send it to the CDC. Right. What, do you, what do you do in Canada? I have a CDC. Uh, <laughs> it, it's, it's us. <laughs> <laughs> You're the central lab for the entire country? Uh, we are. Actually, okay. uh, so it's not us directly. I won't go through bore you with the administrative convolutions <laughs> of how that happened. But technically, there's a branch of the Canadian National Microbiology Laboratory, which is for another for reasons I also won't talk about in Winnipeg. Um, right. But there is one branch of that lab, which is not in Winnipeg, and that's the National Reference Center for Parasitology, which is which is connected with us. But I will say that we work very closely with CDC. They um, uh, have right. uh, obviously a much bigger operation than we do, and a lot of resources, and so we do share a lot. And we and we in many cases will do a lot of the same types of testing that they do. Mm -hmm. uh, they they share with us in many cases a lot of their materials. Did you try to culture it at all? Uh, we didn't. Uh, you know something? I mean, we, we could have because as it happens, we, we, we do it for animal trypanosomes. Right. Um, and I'm not sure I'm not sure people have described in the clinical scenarios the sensitivity of that mm. compared to, for example, the microscopy. Um, it's not fantastically easy to culture trypanosomes. Um, so that's Using the NNN and, medium? Yeah. <laughs> it's true. And in the in the in the in the day, now that we do have molecular tools, um, it's it becomes sure. more academic. Sure. So, Michael, did you attempt to treat the gentleman? Uh, so yes. So, so that's it. So we did. We 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 did accept that as a diagnosis, and uh, uh, of course we did treat him. And in fact, again, one of the people who wrote in did talk about the, the treatment. I, and I yes. Uh, at, at that time, so right now, he's he's correct that the um, that the treatment that would be accepted for for neurologic disease in um, West African trypanosomiasis would be a combination of eflornithine and nifertamox. In fact, at the time that he saw us, we the, the recommendation was to use eflornithine alone, and and that's what uh, we did use, just the uh, eflornithine. Eflornithine. I don't know if there's time to talk about it, but fantastic that's story right. behind. The development of that compound, uh, e eflornithine was developed by a drug company as an anti-cancer drug. Uh, turned out to be not a very good anti-cancer drug, and was about to be thrown on the trash bin when uh, some researchers and I, I can't remember off the top of my head who they were, but they were screening compounds for 
anti-trypanosomal activity, and they uh, screening a huge number of compounds and happened to notice that eflornithine had a, had a, had had very good activity, and for some reason, specifically against the West African variant, not nearly as much against the East African strains. Uh, and so very rapidly, they put it through some testing and animal testing, and it got brought quite quickly into human use in West Africa and shown to be fantastically effective. The problem was that the company that had originally put it, designed it as an anti-cancer agent wasn't really interested in a drug <laughs> that uh, had very little use other than treating some small number of people in Africa. And so they uh, stopped, they, they turned their remaining stock over to uh, Médecins Sans Frontières, Doctors Without Borders, and they said, listen, here's what we have left. We'll let you guys distribute it, but uh, we're getting out of this business. And um, it was um, the drug was fantastic because it was much less toxic than the previous drug, which yeah. somebody also mentioned, malarsoprol, which which is essentially arsenic. Right. And so mm -hmm. the previous drug, the drug actually killed ten percent of the people that yeah. we gave it to. Um, not a great track record. Whereas if fluorinethine was much more benign, uh, but we were running out of stock of the drug, and somebody. Again, I don't know who, but somebody discovered that, like a lot of anti-cancer drugs, it was pretty good at killing off hair. Exactly. And yes. they realized that you could use this drug topically, and um, it was a great way to remove, for example, unwanted facial hair. Mm. And so the product actually became a valuable product in the Western world. I think it was as, Crystal Myers, wasn't it? <laughs> exactly. As an agent for, um, for unwanted, it's a prescription drug, but still for, I guess, particularly stubborn, unwanted facial hair, yeah, it becomes, right. uh, it be, and, and, and uh, it's, a, it's a drug that still has quite a market. And the company <laughs> that makes the drug, in collaboration with WHO, agreed to divert a percentage of the production to continue to provide this drug to, for treatment of trypanosomiasis. So it's yeah. a, one of the total miracle that we have the drug. And, it, and I assume it penetrates the CNS, right? It does. Mm -hmm. And it does a, an amazing job. It's certainly compared to killing people with arsenic. Yeah, I wanted to correct another uh, <laughs> portion. <laughs> this is true, by the way. Uh, one of the, the um, responders uh, intimated that um, ivermectin might have been used, but it wouldn't cross the blood-brain barrier. But perhaps the organisms had come out of the brain cells and therefore were more susceptible in the cerebrospinal fluid. It, it, Africa trypanosomiasis, in no case does the organism live inside cells. Mm -hmm. It's it's either in the lymph or it's in the blood, but it's never inside of cells. It's not, they're not sensitive to ivermectin, period. They're right? not. A, that, that's right, because that that inhibits some brain uh, chemistry. Right. So, um, but the but the American trypanosomes only live in blood, or rather in cells, and they're only transmitted from one place to another very briefly as they go from cell to cell. So, I always like to think of uh, American trypanosomiasis as intracellular parasites and African trypanosomes as extracellular parasites yeah. to well, keep them straight. I, I ran this clinical case past my wife, who worked for many years at Merck on ivermectin. And she said immediately, uh, you know, African sleeping sickness. I said, but the guy had ivermectin. She said, wouldn't, wouldn't have done anything. Correct. <laughs> well, I, 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 He's sort of, I was baiting her <laughs> to see if she got that. And All I right. said, well, you still remember your stuff, huh? Right. It's good to compliment your wife now and then. You know? Absolutely. Oh, yeah. more than every now and then. So, Michael, did the gentleman uh, turn out well? <laughs> Well, so in fact, um, he did. It was it, uh, it's a very slowly responsive uh, the disease responds very slowly to treatment, but um, it is uh, really remarkable. He um, it took months, but over the course of time, uh, he got better. His brain scan got better, mm -hmm. and um, after about a year, uh, he really was. Uh, he would say almost back to normal. He mm -hmm. still felt that cognitively he wasn't quite uh, as sharp as he as he had been, and he had some, of course, again, a little hard to sort out. He, he certainly might have had some psychological difficulties for a host of other reasons as well, so <laughs> Sorry. hard to completely sort that out, but uh, an absolutely dramatic difference, yeah. even though it took a long time. It's fascinating, though, Michael, a, a fantastic case. Well, I remember, Michael, when uh, you were telling me about this, you had this little clip, and in French, um, he was asked, uh, well, he was actually asked in English what was wrong with him, and I remember the response in French was, uh, maybe you can share that with everybody. Well, so, 
when I was gathering together, I, I wanted to present this case. And one of the, one of, you know, there are some nice things about psychiatrists. And one of the nice things <laughs> is that when they do these intake evaluations of patients, they do these fairly in-depth interviews and they record them. And these recordings become part of the patient's file. So it was actually possible for me to go back more than a year and pull out his initial uh, evaluation by psychiatry when he came in uh, to the system and he had this uh, this interview with the psychiatrist. And, and we actually have it on tape where the psychiatrist is basically saying, what do you think is wrong with you? Why do you think you're here? And um, and and at that time he was complaining particularly of, of you know the, the many things we talked about, but especially of the of, a, of sleep disorder. Uh, and, and so he actually said to the psychiatrist, "J'ai la maladie de sommeil," yeah. which I which in fact I, I believe he was, <laughs> he, was saying, he was saying I know what the diagnosis is. Oh my god! And unfortunately, the psychiatrist. Well, I think he was aware of this disease, hmm. and even in his somewhat confused state, recognized what was happening to him. But the psychiatrist, right. he put his faith perhaps in the doctor, but the psychiatrist didn't, he just interpreted that statement to mean, I have a problem with my sleep. Right. And, uh, but I have that, yeah, so it's quite something. So I show that recording where he's actually talking to the psychiatrist and, and, and she, and he basically says, I, I have sleeping sickness. And, and then she just continues the conversation. <laughs> She says, yes, we know that, but what do you think is wrong with you? <laughs> he diagnosed himself. That's right, right, that's right. Yeah, she just says that, but tell me about your mother. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> wow, that's great. Well, we have a title, La Maladie de Sommeil. Right? Wouldn't that be a great thing? Yeah. Très chic. Michael, thank, thank you so much, Michael. It's my pleasure. Yeah. And maybe you will come back for another one someday. That would be great. Right? I hope so. We would okay. love it. Enjoy your vacation. <laughs> Thanks very much. <laughs> right. Bye bye. So long. Bye bye. Wow, he went for an hour. I guess he got no. Delightful person he. He's is. a very nice guy. I, I like his much style more than you. Absolutely. <laughs> I'm just kidding, Dick. No, you're not. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you, you, can, you can be delightful. Um, can. Yes, he's very nice, and is he's oh, very it's a recording, uh, and you're saying nice things about Dixon. Yeah, yeah, he's oh. very uh, erudite. That threw me off. I thought we were done. <laughs> <laughs> So we have a so we have a great paper. We do. <laughs> we Don, do. Daniel would like to get to the paper. Let's <laughs> yeah, do this. This is actually from uh, Uruguay and Paraguay, and uh, Buenos Aires. So this is quite um, an interesting place. I don't think I've ever done a paper from Paraguay or Uruguay. Mm. <laughs> I didn't know they did research. The name of the paper is "Natural and Induced Antibodies Contribute to Differential." Susceptibility to secondary cystic echinococcosis of Balbsi and C57 black six mice. Right. Wow. Echinococcosis. Cystic. It's a mouthful. Echinococcosis. Right. And this As is opposed a, to the dog stage. Right. Tell us, Dixon, a little, little background. Okay. Well, yeah, I mean, I think we've That's covered. <laughs> <laughs> I love the way he listens a little. <laughs> <laughs> Echinococcosis. Uh, ping pongs between dogs and sheep for the most part, although their animals are susceptible, as you can see from these mouse studies. Um, the dog harbors the adult stage, which is a four-segmented long tapeworm, quite small, Echinococcus granulosus. And uh, as the segment, the last segment drops off and becomes dissolved in the stool, releasing the eggs, which then find their way to the exterior, the sheep ingest, along with their meal of grass, some portion of dog feces with the eggs mm. in them. The eggs hatch. The larva inside, called a hexacanth larva, then migrates through the blood after it's swallowed into the intestine, gets into the blood supply, and usually ends up in the liver of the sheep, developing these very large, watery, hydatid cysts, as they're called. And we've covered some of this before. Then, as the sheep are slaughtered, <coughs> and the uh, farmer or rancher sees that his sheep have been infected with this parasite, rendering the livers unsellable, doesn't want to waste anything, they feed them back to the dogs, and the dogs catch millions of new adult tapeworms. Mm -hmm. And so it's a terrible cycle. That and wherever you find sheep herding and sheep uh, uh, raising, the shepherding of sheep, you're going to find this parasite. So it's found throughout the world. And it's sometimes it's a major problem in other places like Iceland. They eliminated it by simply getting rid of all the sheep and all the dogs. <laughs> and then cesareanly sectioning and wow. rebirthing 
their sheep population and their dog population have very, very strict immigration. Wow, they laws. culled the sheep and the they dog. Did. Every oh, one of them. They, they just killed them all. But in other places, like, for instance, uh, Cyprus, which was half owned by Turkey and, and Greece, uh, they had a very difficult time eliminating this parasite from that island, even though they wanted to, because uh, the way the Greeks were doing it is uh, by treating dogs and, and being good epidemiologists. The way the Turks were doing it were going around in jeeps with army guys with automatic weapons, and they were shooting any dog that wasn't on a tether. Mm. And so the Greeks thought that the Turks were trying to start a war with them rather than trying to control Kanakaka. Wow. So if at one point it almost started a war between two countries. So humans get it by fecal contamination with dog feces. That's right? exactly right. right. So there's a lot of human Kanakakas out there, and, and it's throughout South America. It's even Some of it is still in the British Isles. In fact, yeah. we just did a case we did. last week, That's right? right? We solved it last week, the lady from uh, Kolkata. Exactly right. She had a Kanakakas, right? Actually, that's true, yes. I so, did yeah. insist. Right? Wherever you look for it, you'll find it. And certainly New Zealand, Australia, places like that. Did you like, like the name of that episode that I came up with? Scroll down, please. I did. Oh, it was great. I did. That was good. It was terrific. I don't know if we scroll down or scroll up, but it doesn't really matter. <laughs> Inici- right. Initially, I was like, oh, maybe I need to do something. To and I was like, oh, that's the title. <laughs> right. right. I, I was scrolling. I was following commands. So as far as I know, there are no... Um, genetically isolated groups of people who are less susceptible to, to a kind of caucus than those that uh, catch it routinely, since it is found throughout the world and, and, and it is identified as a medical problem wherever it's found. So this article, this research paper, is, is mainly investigating the immunogenetics of two inbred strains of mice to try to determine what the um, most effective immune response set of responses might be against this parasite. Why would we care? Well, you might want to investigate making a vaccine based on the epitopes that they could identify this way, perhaps. Epitopes? Epitopes. You mean an epitope vaccine? Perhaps. <laughs> That's it's... a stupid thing to say. <laughs> I'm just trying to trip you up. No, you're not trying to trip me up. I'm not? <laughs> we had trips in the last case. <laughs> epitope vaccine. Every vaccine is an epitope vaccine. Not all of them. Unless you give a DNA vaccine, but Aha! it encodes epitopes, right? Well, yes, but in this case, you could have a molecular I... vaccine of only the epitopes. Of a molecular vaccine. vaccine. Is that like molecular pathogenesis? That's close you're getting close so daniel what caught your attention uh yeah. in this paper i'm just curious you know there there were a couple things that that caught my attention um the the biggest thing was the whole natural antibody okay um spin that they've got going here so they're using yeah i actually liked your email vincent vincent sent an email when i uh, selected this saying you know my sly and monkeys exaggerate <laughs> and uh, i think i think that's very true did you know that i did but it, i'm trying to find out where that's a quote from is that a simon and garf no no it's someone actually Alan. wrote into twiv and claimed it he <laughs> said i made that up but. oh <laughs> Yeah, but Alan Dove originally brought it up when we were talking about how mouse models are yeah, yeah, yeah. often not right, but neither are monkey models, which are the closest to us. Yeah, yeah. And even though chimps are, and many monkeys are 99% similar in nucleic acid sequence to humans, for you, Dixon, 100%. <laughs> I'm sorry. You know, you have, to, you have to be much nicer than that, Vince. Um, really I'm just do. kidding. We're all 99%. <laughs> for example, this is a great ex- one. Uh, Peter Palazzi once told me, you know, Everyone complains that ferrets, you know, they're a model for flu. Wow, why, how can they be a good model? He said, well, <laughs> you would think that an ape is a good model, but if you spray flu in an ape's nose, nothing happens. You have to, put, you have to intubate and put the virus into the trachea mm. to infect an ape. Wow. And there's that, our cousins there, you know. So, so the viral receptors are not there until you get down Wow, well, listen to this guy. Hey, listen I'm on to twibble. this. I'm on twibble. Um, it could be receptors or something else, who knows, right? But the point is, animals... Equals with a slash yeah. humans, right? That's right. <laughs> there are very few parasites that are actually valid, no matter which animal species we you work use. with what we have. Trichinosis is right? one of those that will infect any group of animals. You, you work with what you have, you get results, and then you try to do observational no, that's right. that's studies right. in humans that would yeah. validate them, right? Yeah, well, this, I don't think that the purpose of this paper is to validate something in humans. No, I it's think. to make an epitope vaccine, as you said. Right? <laughs> well, they're, not, they're, they're looking to see what the mechanism of immunity might be. Also, to see well, they, what it attacks. In the end, they have two, these two strains. Yeah. These are two laboratory strains, which are yeah. highly inbred. Highly right? inbred. Extremely, yes. And they have different responses at to the opposite parasite. Opposite ends of the... And at the same time, spectrum. different antibody responses. That's mm-hmm. right. And while they can't prove 
that the antibody response is the cause of the differential, right? They don't prove it. They do yeah, statistics. Yeah, a lot of it is correlations. They do correlations. Right. Correlation is not causation, Dr. De Pommier. Did you discover that yourself, doctor? <laughs> <laughs> it's an Italian accent. Have help? That's an Italian accent. I'm trying to come up with Scotty. Oh, okay. <laughs> or Dr. Chekhov, Mr. Chekhov. I think the natural antibody angle is very interesting, and uh, perhaps we can explain at some point what a natural antibody is when we get to that experiment, right? Sure, sure. We can definitely do that. So, so Daniel, what is the first experiment you want to relay to us? There, so there are lots here, but we don't need to... Yeah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to skip through the table. There's a table which you know we'll maybe refer to. So... Uh, all our readers probably have the paper in front of them, so I'll refer them to <laughs> figure one. I'm only joking. That's uh, what that's what an MD does in a journal club. They just skip us to the data. Okay, figure one. <laughs> actually, you know, I think I think a lot of researchers do that actually, right? They go right to the figures, yeah, and once you've looked at the figures, then you go back and consider like, am I going to bother reading the text? But the first thing they do is they actually take you've got these two different strains of mice, and they're going to expose them. Um, to 2,000 protoscolices. Right. And then what they're going to basically see. What's a, what's you know, a protoscolice? Dixon. Dixon should tell us that. Uh, it's the <laughs> stage. It's Is it a segment? No, no, no. It's the stage inside of the hydatid cyst that, when swallowed by the dog, will become a scolex. So it's right. a protoscolex. So they, it's they before do, the scolex. They do IP inoculation of these protoscolices. So intraperitoneal. And what, what they're, so basically you take the mouse, it's going to be laying on its back. You're going to pinch up a little bit. You're going to put a needle under the skin, and you're going to actually inject um, a small amount, they say 200 microliters, um, with all these infectious... Um, <laughs> notice, <laughs> notice he said the mouse is, is laying on its back. <laughs> so he anesthetizes his mice. I used to do it living... <laughs> You grab the scruff of their neck, wrap yeah. the tail around your pinky, yes, uh, and then you inject. But then they're wiggling around, and sometimes you can miss. Never, never. It's no, the skill. No, after no, few, after 3,000 no, no, mice. No, no, yeah, but how many before that? <laughs> you know, I had a, I had a friend who took, was in medical school, and he, this is when I was a graduate student, and they had a teacher who, who was teaching them about something about the bladder. And he said he would say, after three thousand underwater dissections, <laughs> I can tell you that. And there was something. So apparently, when you yeah. do underwater dissections, you know the, the organs float rather than are being collapsed, and you okay. can learn different things. Did oh, you know that? I, you I know did that? not. I've never done an underwater dissection. And this was a joke among medical students. <laughs> after three thousand underwater <laughs> dissections. Okay, so you're going to inject okay. what into the mice? So they're going to inject the protoscolices in basically sterile. PBS, so right. salt but they're water. alive. These are these are viable protoscolices. Okay, so now wait a minute. This is a disconnect from the life cycle, though. Okay. Yes, because ordinarily a protoscolex <laughs> would be swallowed by a dog. Yeah, they would get swallowed. To its peritoneum, right? No, 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 no. They would swallow the the protoscolex and yeah. it would attach to the small intestine and uh, develop yeah. into an adult tapeworm. So what happens in this situation? Uh, so the first thing we notice is that the two different um, strains of mice react quite differently as far as the number of cysts that go on to form. Oh, wait. Oh, so instead of getting an adult <laughs> tapeworm, you're going to make a cyst from a protoscolex. Exactly. Where, do they, where do the cysts form in the IP, in the peritoneum? They do. Okay. So this says that there are a lot of stem cells in this parasite. There's a ton of them. It's a weird model, isn't it? It's a it? very weird model. Yeah. It's a very weird model. Because it's disconnected but from... But remember, in an adult person that has an idatted cyst, if that thing ruptures, mm -hmm. what happens? You're screwed. And blued you have and a, You have a big anaphylactic reaction. Number one. If so you survived it. Let's say you survived that. Well, then they disseminate. That's right. And then what? They attach elsewhere. And, and each one develops into uh, a new cyst. Horrible. They don't develop to adult yeah. worms. They develop into... New, that's stem cell. Death. That is stem cell biology. Yeah, you want, you make new animals from a single cell. Yeah, there you go. Yeah. So that's the model that they're employing okay. here. Okay. Very yeah, good. This is almost sort of the the response to a cyst rupture. It's kind Correct. of a, kind of a closer. <coughs> Which was uh, why they're concerned about the primary and then the secondary response, because that's what happens in a chronic infection. Number of cysts and parasite load. So some yes. of them develop into parasites and they, they circulate, I guess. Oh, in the you would blood. call the cysts. No, no, no. They stay in the peritoneum. They stay right there, and and they develop into these uh, small identified cysts. But they have two parameters they measure, and one of them is number of cysts, and the other is parasite load. Isn't that number of parasites in the blood then? This doesn't get in the blood. So where are they looking at parasite load? And Inside the cyst. There are oh, within the cyst. Got it. All right, got it. You need to make that clear next time. 
<laughs> I need to make that clear. You need to ask the right questions. All right. So anyway, <laughs> I asked you what it mean. <laughs> and I thought many, I told you three times as many cysts form in our Balb C guys as the Black Seven. Right. And 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 they're going to claim three here times. Is that statistically times. significant? Oh, I'd What's say the that's... p value? Uh, less than point zero five. They actually did statistics. <laughs> you know, that's now a new NIH requirement, right? Because uh, apparently, with all these retractions, mm-hmm. uh, scientists oh, have dear. to now make sure that we we perform our work with an appropriate rigor and statistical what? significance. You know what the, the <laughs> irony there is? It's standards. You know, something may have a good p-value, which doesn't mean it's biologically correct. It just means correct. you did it a lot. All the p-value tells you how many times you did it. <laughs> okay. Yes. So one strain has three times more than another. And right. six times as many parasites. Within the cysts, and okay. Six so they and and But then they put the last thing is that... The cysts in the, the C57 black, we'll call them the Balbsy and the black mice, the black mice actually have more big cysts. So they have a number of cysts that are larger. Do you, do you have a comment, Dixon? No, I was just... Really You're just punching me there. Just You're punching just him. Cheer. You're just excited. This cheering is good you stuff on. For I'm you. cheering you on. This is good stuff. <laughs> Okay. No, no, serious. So, so the first thing we're finding out is that when they expose these two different types of mice, we're seeing different outcomes. We're seeing basically more cysts, more parasites. Do in either the, uh, the, the black or the balbs, do they die or they're both alive at this point, right? They're alive. No, they're alive. So right. the, this is the parameter we're going to follow for the rest of the paper, that one strain makes more cysts and parasites That's than the right. other, right? Claiming one is more susceptible. Got it. And now they're going to say, why is that? What is it, what is it about the... The mouse is different. Okay, so if you just stop right there and you just ask the <laughs> listeners to say, well, what would be the possibilities? One is that one is not an appropriate host because it's nutritionally deficient in something that the parasite might need, that the other... A true host. parasitologist yeah. answer, yeah. as opposed to molecular genetics. No, 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 then you start to say, <laughs> well, if that's not the case, then what could be the difference? And the yeah. answer is the immune system. The immune system would be my first thought. Of course it would be. But Wouldn't be yours? Could be a lot of other reasons for it. Yeah, of course. Of course. I mean, these are all artificial. They're inbred lab mice, right? Sure. And that's why there's a thing called the collaborative cross. Do you know about this? Uh, no, what is? Tell me. So it's a um, cross put together by a consortium where they take a number of lab strains and some mm, wild yes. strains, and they breed them, and you get basically a, a, a wild a type wild type mouse, and they use Ow. those for experiments. And, for example, when you infect them with Ebola, for the first time, the virus does what sort of what it does in people, as opposed to in the lab mice, where it doesn't mm-hmm. do anything like... So you really need to outbreed to make them more like people. <coughs> so we were... There was we're a talk just, on this this week, actually. Yes, right? Yesterday, maybe? It was recently. Yeah, so, another, yeah. another aside, of course, before we get to the actual data, <laughs> was that in the old days, that is my days, we were working with different inbred strains of mice for mm. trichinella, and they gave completely different results, just like these two strains of, of mice did too. But, mice lie. But it raised so much argumentative behavior among the investigators. One would accuse the other of not doing the experiments right, you're of course. screwing everything up, and then you turn it, they were both right. I'll tell you what, Dixon, <laughs> there have been examples where people in different cities use the same mice, the same inoculum, oh, I know, I know, I know. everything appears to be the same and they get it's totally different results. The same, mm-hmm. Maybe the technician had a different aftershave that day, who knows? Remember Judah different... Volkman and his results? And he was the... a fraud, wasn't he? Of course not. <laughs> oh, I'm thinking of the guy at Sloan Kettering who- Not Judah Volk, that's Robert Good. Colored the mice. Yeah, it's a, it's yeah. a Summerlin. Summer, uh, summer band or Summerlin, something. Summerlin, Summerlin. 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 That was the transplant where yes. they were, yeah. yeah. Oh that's my right. gosh. That's right. It yeah, it's interesting. Mouse. It's interesting how a strain of <laughs> mouse can raise so much ire. Yes. No, but I mean, so much is at stake. I mean, they think their whole reputation is based on whether they're right or wrong, well, and they were is. both. They it both is. came out right. So, Daniel, they looked at the immune response, and they looked and at that, antibodies because. Well, I think you know, as we've kind of, if you've been listening to it for a while, you've probably gotten the sense parasites are big animals. Um, they're, they're, mm-hmm. you know, a few of them are getting intracellular, right? So, in general, how do you how do you combat a big animal and um, antibodies? The with oral big, response with a big protein, right? <laughs> exactly. exactly. How do you handle a hungry? <laughs> how do you handle a big? <laughs> animal, <handle> a big <laughs> yes. <laughs> and and the, the big stick here is antibodies, right? So uh, so they look at the quantity of different types of antibodies. And this is getting at our natural antibody idea. And so going into this, maybe we should give the readers a little background. One of the big differences between the black mice and the Balbsy mice is that the black 57 mice have more B1 cells, more natural antibody producing cells in their peritoneum. 
um, they tend to be a more natural antibody protected strain. What is so, a natural antibody? So natural antibodies are antibodies that are actually selected by evolution rather than the experience of that particular individual mouse. So, so they, you have them at any time in your life. You don't have to be so induced human, by an Yeah, infection. human beings, mice, yeah. go all the way back to sharks. All sort of animals from sharks on up are, are born with natural antibodies circulating in there. And what do they recognize? They recognize all the um, pathogens that as a species we've seen over time. So recognize flu and pneumococcus and E. coli and salmonella. And uh, they're there to basically bias that first week um, before the B2 and all the sort of adaptive responsive antibodies come on the scene. So that's when you, you get infected and your ant the antigens of the pathogen are brought to the lymph node and there are B cells producing this natural antibody that will initially recognize the pathogen. Not even just the lymph nodes, but in our circulation. If you right. measure, draw someone's blood and measure, there's a lot of IgM is what it predominantly is early on. Later on, you'll have IgG and other forms. Yeah. But 90% of that is selected for by evolution, this and wonderful then, shield. And then uh, later on, you get... Uh, so, uh, mutation and selection of high high affinity antibodies. Exactly, and you sort of see yeah. spikes. Oh, now I've got ones for tetanus. Now I've got ones yeah. for whatever else I got exposed. So to. there's an interesting set of natural antibodies in people and, and other animals I know about that are produced, uh, which react with uh, sugars on the surfaces of gut bacteria, mm -hmm. and um, it's because they have a an enzyme that puts a sugar on their surface that we don't have. And so we, we have a, high t a large fraction of our antibodies circulating at any given time is against these alpha-gal sugar moieties. And then when viruses infect you that have previously uh, been growing in an animal with alpha-gal specificity, we immediately can, without having to wait two weeks, you yeah. can bind and engage complement and so forth. And we call those natural antibodies as well. Ex those, yeah. That's exactly, yeah. Okay. And uh, <clears throat> so what they do here is they look at these different um, types of IgG and IgM here. And I guess I'll, I'll say they, they look at several things. And the high point, the takeaway from the figure is that the BALB C's very quickly have higher levels. I mean, the black 57, the resistant guys, very quickly develop higher levels of IgM. Um, and they also IgG 2B. Now, the reverse is that the BALB C's have significantly higher levels of IgG1. Right. Okay. And so those are, so those are I'll say, um, as far as the quantity of the antibodies they see. So they actually go on to the next figure, and they're looking at the quality. How, how well do these antibodies bind? The affinity. Um, yeah, the, they use this. Chiotropic elution. Have you ever done? <laughs> Am I pronouncing that right? Probably not. I never pronounce things correctly. Chiotropic. Chiotropic. Is that how you do it? Yeah, it's fine. Okay. We knew what you meant. <laughs> That's good. Um, you know, and they're seeing, you know, in certain situations, uh, differences in the in the binding um, avidity, how how well they bind. Um, but I think the thing they're starting to argue as we go forward here is that the different mice are making different types of antibodies. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's exactly right. Mm-hmm. Exactly. And then I, I don't, I don't want to bring us through all the figures because people will probably die on us here. But, but where's, <laughs> what, where are they going with this? But they're, they're trying to go with this with the idea as we discussed that the C57 black mice um, – are resistant in part because they have better natural antibodies and, you know, to take us that stretch, not just IgM, but also this IgG2B natural antibodies. The, the one experiment which I liked was this transfer of serum That's right. from black 6 into BALB C, and that confers resistance to the BALB C. Or so secondary infections. Secondary That's infections. Right. That's right. So that that tells you that in the, in the uninfected BALB C, there are antibodies that are better at taking care of these protoscolices, right? Exactly right. I thought that was cool. Significant reduction in the number of developed cysts 41 weeks post-infection. Right. Very cool. So and, and, the, and the reduction, accent. Dixon, the reduction was threefold. <laughs> exactly how much more the, the, the whites, the BALB Cs do, right, in terms of the number of cysts. You almost don't have to do a What's the p-value of that? That's probably 95% <laughs> confident. But, but they did another <laughs> assay as well, and that is a killing uh, assay for the proscolix itself. <laughs> yes. So they used the antibody. It's a complement-mediated uh, killing response, but the antibody enhances 
the killing. So therefore, that even at that level, the uh, antibody producer, the valve seam mouse, right. was much better at doing that than so the C fifty seven. One lock. question that I, I came up with was, well, why would one strain of mice? Now, mice never see a kind of caucus, do they? No, they don't. I mean, why would one strain have more natural antibodies That's than the other? Very good Is it random? Question. Is it just chance? Chance favors the prepared mind. <laughs> it does. Maybe it are, favors the prepared immune system. <laughs> it, 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 there are paras, there are tapeworm infections that do infect mice that might cross react in terms of their epitopes with the Echinococcus granulosis <laughs> epitopes. <laughs> Why do you say it so carefully? <laughs> because I wanted to emphasize the fact that epitope is the name of this game, because <laughs> that's what the antibody is responding to. But why would this strain of mouse, which never seen... Well, remember, we can't ask why questions in biology. No. What is the function ah, of better. having antibodies, natural <laughs> antibodies? Better. Is it thus, It must be an epitope. Like common. A, a carbohydrate epitope that's very common among maybe. other things as could well. Be right? very well. Mm -hmm. Very well could be. Because they have never seen a kind of caucus. Well, exactly. maybe they did millions of years ago. Yeah. And we don't know about yeah. it. And that remains in the I know, Vincent, line. for instance, in trichinella, there's an epitope, a carbohydrate epitope that cross-reacts with salmonella group D. Epitope, mm -hmm. and it's a it's a it's a sugar moiety. That's a it's a pentose, and it's a weird sugar. It's I mean, tyvolose is a weird sugar. Excellent. I never saw an epitope I didn't like. Bring me an epitope, and I will show you. <laughs> <laughs> what Bring is that your from? Epitopes. What is that from? I never saw an epitope I didn't like. That's a play. Um, play on. No, something. no, that's uh, Will Rogers. I never saw what that I didn't. I never like. met a man I didn't like. Never met an individual. I, I met plenty. Like. Hmm. Yeah. Haven't you? And women and uh, he children. Was a very, uh, <laughs> I know a lot of likable guy, and he. Uh, so uh, in the end, Daniel, we we find that two strains of mice, differential susceptibility to a kind of caucus, uh, which could be explained by different antibody, natural antibody responses. Right. Right. That's the conclusion. It's not a big surprise, however. I mean, this no, is not a surprise. But often science, is, often science is not, but you These have are, to do the experiment. It's fine. Certainly I have no, I have no problem do. with that. No, I don't either. Are there any... <laughs> I'm okay with it, Why too. would I have a problem with it? <laughs> right, I did it all my Daniel, life. Daniel, <laughs> one of the things I meant to, to emphasize, which we didn't, was yeah. that uh, in, in the one strain where the antibodies were not so effective at, or at least they didn't correlate with, um, with reduced clearance... These were antibodies that don't do not engage complement very well. Yeah, and that was and that was the big point that sort of when you looked at that second figure we yeah, talked about, yeah. you can jump in. Is that the IgG one? Well, we know that complement has been shown previously to be um, involved in in killing um, when there's exposure to right, this infection. Right. IgG one is not really good at engaging complement. Mm -hmm. um, definitely not as good as IgG two. And so here, in a sense, they're, they're, well, they're suggesting, they're giving us evidence that the subclass of antibody that gets induced is really critical. So when we're looking at vaccination strategies, sure. and there actually is a lot of work going on vaccinating mm -hmm. dogs, sheep, mm -hmm. um, maybe get even a vaccination for humans right. as well in here. You want to make sure that the type of antibodies you trigger are going to be ones exactly. that actually can get complemented. Assuming engaged. that mice are not lying, right? Well, you you have to ask them the right questions. The antibody yeah. is an antibody, Dixon. <laughs> you have to keep it simple for the mice. <laughs> I think that's the bottom line. That yeah. you we want to know what epitopes to use, right, Dixon? <laughs> we would love yeah. to know which epitopes. Yeah, when you're going to make a vaccine, you want to know, you know, okay. what what to use to make the vaccine. Good. Exactly. All right. And, uh, yeah, and I, I would say this is interesting. You know, all those people that fought over, like, my mouse did this and your mouse did that. Yeah, right. You know, the, it's not that the data is wrong. It's the interpretation. And that's really what science is about. And when you find something that is different than somebody else, maybe there should be more camaraderie. Maybe everyone should come together and say, wow, this is different. So, that's where something exciting Let might. me tell you how it resolved, too. It yeah. was very interesting. Fisticuffs. The way it, I don't know, but it could have. <laughs> I was so old, they wouldn't dare hit him. His name was John Larsh. And he had his own inbred strain of mouse that it was bred at the University of North Carolina School of Public Health. That's where the mouse came from. It was not a, a commercial available strain of mouse. The controversy resolved itself by he sending mice to the other laboratory. The other laboratory ended up sending mice to his laboratory, mm. and he did the same experiments, and he got their results, not his results. And they got his results, not their results. So it was the strain of mouse, not yeah. the laboratory. And at that point, they came out and shook hands. And realized, hey, as we now realize in 2016, different mice How respond about? differently. That's right. Look That's at right. that. So if, if mice lie and uh, what was it? Mus Mon monkeys exaggerate. Monkey, exactly. what, do we, what do people do? <laughs> they fake well, data. People get confused. People are silent. <laughs> people are silent. <laughs> they should be, but they're not.
Yeah, they're silent. That's true. All right. Do we have? Do we have Ooh. by the any chance uh, another case report? We do. I brought another case. <laughs> yes. <Good. clears throat> Okay. Stump the chumps. Hopefully people will enjoy this case. So here's our case. I enjoyed the last one very much. Loved it. And by the way, you and I had made eye contact at yeah. the end of that case, and we both well, got we, it right. We, we guessed that, yeah. But Daniel tried to send me off on the, well, in the hallway. Know, he's devious. <laughs> I, 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 I didn't devious. want it to be too easy. He's a devious guy. Oh and uh, as, as we learned now, um, this is parasitism. Any kind of eukaryotic parasite is, uh, is fair game, right? Uh-oh, there's a hint. <laughs> Maybe not. <laughs> well, the key is that sometimes the symptoms really overlap, so yes. you need a good differential, right, Dixon? And a good laboratory. Yeah, and that's what I'll ask this time. Yeah. So as I go through the case, I want people to, let, let's get the broad differential. You know, we've got a lot of, what shall we call them, parasitism junkies, and they're going to throw, but try to throw in some other options, um, because you know what, We until we make the diagnosis, we don't necessarily know it's a parasite, so right. that's what I'll ask for this time. Okay. This is the story of a, a young man. He's in his 30s, and he's admitted to a hospital up in Anchorage, Alaska in early June. So it was a few years back. And as our le- listeners may remember, I uh, periodically for a while there, I would fly up to Alaska and I'd do hospitalist shifts up there. Mm-hmm. You see some interesting stuff. Did you there. see Sarah Palin? Um, you know, I stood right where her house was. I couldn't see Russia. <laughs> I couldn't see it. You, you know were what? looking for it. There was a strip mall in the way. It was this dilapidated strip mall there in Wasilla. Oh, no, you, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what she must have better vision than I do, because it's really far from Wasilla to Russia. Okay. So back to, back, back on task. Early June. Early June. So it's early June, and his chief complaint is severe muscle pain and tenderness. They hurt, and they're also very tender. He reports that usually he's a very healthy guy, and he's very um, adamant about that. But about one week ago, he had a bad case of diarrhea with belly pain and vomiting. Surprises him, because he's a really healthy guy. And this lasted for a full week, and then he started to feel better, but now he's having fever, feels hot. Um, He hasn't actually measured it, and his muscles um, hurt. And he is concerned. The reason he came in is that his wife told him he had to go in because now she is starting to have diarrhea. And she said, you should go get checked. I'm starting to have diarrhea. Two buckets. A two-bucket disease. (laughs) You already know? Alaska is the key? Okay. Okay. No, well, there's a couple of keys. All right, so I'm going to give our listeners a little bit more. Um, and as mentioned, past medical history, unremarkable. The guy's a healthy guy, doesn't remark any problems in the past. He's never had surgery. Um, he's not allergic to any medications, but he hasn't really been on many because he's been so healthy. Um, his family history, he doesn't know. He says, I don't know about my parents. Uh, <laughs> and he's married, right? <laughs> he is married. And uh, he's, does he have extramarital affairs? He, d- he does not report any. Is he HIV negative? He is HIV negative. Okay. Any other physical? Does he have? Did he have his in, his entire uh, childhood vaccination uh, course? Oh, good... Yes, actually, he re- he reports normal. He got his vaccines, all of them, all of those. Does he eat raw meat? Um, well, that's an interesting question. I'm gonna actually I'm gonna do this sort of exposure history because I think that's um, no, he does not eat raw meat. Um, <laughs> does he eat raw meat? Um, um, he, he doesn't take any medications. Or undercooked meat. Um, so, you know. He does seasonal work, as he uh, tells us. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, he lives with his wife. Um, he says he's a social drinker. I wonder what that means in Alaska. <laughs> but, uh, it means that he drinks until the sun comes up, which takes six months. <laughs> exactly. what, does he do? what does he do for a living? He says seasonal work. What does that mean? You know, in the summer, he'll sometimes do some stuff with the fishing and in the oh, winter, and he doesn't work that much in the winter. He drinks in the winter. Yeah. Wow. Socially. Socially. A lot Socially. of other people drink in the winter with Yeah. Him. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, um, and you asked about the, you know, he doesn't eat raw meat, but, but he, is, he is like an Alaskan. He's a hunter. Oh, uh, really? So he will, he will, you know, he'll hunt. Has he hunted lately? Um, he actually, yes, he came back from a successful hunt recently. Uh, was this shortly before the onset of his illness? Um, it was. It was. Okay. And what did he hunt on this? Successful? He was out. It was black bear season. And he got a black bear. 
Got a black bear. Yep. But he cooked the meat. What did he before do? He ate it. it. But he dressed it, right? Yeah, he dressed it. And, and what uh, did he? Uh, he dressed it in the field. Yeah, I mean, he was out. He had um, one of those four wheelers. Mm-hmm. And four wheeler you know, is that four a truck wheelers? terrain? Vehicle. Like an all terrain thing that he okay. was used to get the meat back. Um, I think it's sad that he's killing bears, but okay. I guess they have a lot of them up there, right? A bear is a is a wonderful creature. It is. I agree with you. Uh, he dressed it in the field, then he took it back and cooked it at home really well, right? Didn't say cooked it really well. He said he cooked it. All right. Did his wife also eat the bear meat? Um, she didn't. She yeah. She said. I mean, he's got a bunch of it, and he's got it in the freezer. So she didn't dress it, but he she has ate it in the freezer. It. She was not. He has it she, in the freezer. She okay. was not on the bear hunt with him. Did she pull it out of the freezer by any chance? But she has had some bear meat since he got back. He had some. You know, she they had eat some bear fresh meats. bear meat or a frozen bear meat. Um, he ate both, and uh, both. you know, both. it's unclear whether or not the with the wife had it been in the freezer for any period of time before she oh, had um, okay. some bear meat. But they've both eaten bear meat. Indeed. But they've also eaten a lot of other things in common too. All right, don't give us any ringers. You know? <laughs> <laughs> what else did they eat in common uh, that might be suspect? Do they? Eat, they probably don't eat any vegetables, right? <laughs> <laughs> Interesting enough, you're you're right. He does not eat a lot of vegetables. <laughs> Until they get surprised? their vertical farms up and running, there won't be. But there are some now in Alaska, believe it or not. So um, it's coming to a neighborhood near you. Do they eat um, any other meats recently that were either hunted or purchased? Um, so salmon, salmon. Um, but at this point, he's just finishing off from the year before. It's early June. Is this stuff he caught? Um, yeah, he catches. He catches his own salmon. And it was frozen. Yes. Yeah, and he's just about out. It's about time to start fishing again for salmon. Anything else? Um, no. Does he When he hunts, does he drink water from the stream? He does sometimes. Yeah. Good question. Yeah, I'm learning from you guys. Very good question. Um, yeah. Okay. Any questions from you, Dixon? Physical examination. What sure. So, so initially, when he's seen, he's uh, he's a little hot. He's thirty eight point five. Um, but you can't see that, though, right? You no, no. This is this. They measure this. They do. What is his All right, face? So they, I'm going to give you the vitals, and then we'll tell you. So his temperature is thirty eight point five. Blood pressure one fifteen over seventy five. Heart rate's one hundred and five. So it's a little bit up. Breathing comfortably. Yep. Um, on physical exam, he um, he's he's a little anxious. Um, you mentioned his face. He actually has some swelling around his eyes. Does he now? And, both um, eyes or just one eye? Both eyes, actually. So a periorbital edema, would you say? That, that's the technical, yes. Yes, we would say that. <laughs> By speaking out of turn here. <laughs> yes, he has periorbital edema. Uh, what do his eyeballs look like? I want to know what the sclera of his eyes look like. Tell, tell me why. What are you? What uh, no, are you no, no, you for? have to tell me first. No, he, he, we don't... We don't no, didn't notice anything. <laughs> and under. something under his fingernails also. I want to know about that as well. No, he didn't notice anything. Did you look? <laughs> <laughs> I shrug at that point. Exactly right. So, I mean, uh, no bloodshot eyes, for instance. No, but you know. You're, but he's been <laughs> drinking a lot. So you, how do you differentiate between yeah. alcoholic it was eye not, syndrome? It was not and, commented on. It was not it was, commented it was, on. Yeah, but but could, he, could he have had... You know, would I have been surprised? Let me just say, no, of course not. Would I have been surprised if he had a little, you know, redness to the eyes, or maybe a little something to the nose? That would not be inconsistent with this with this issue. Nothing that you made a note of, at least. Nothing that think. we made a note of. And I'm going to give you guys some labs, okay. and that's Lab. where I'm going to uh, leave you. Okay, here Good. We go. so you're going to get some labs, and then I'm going to ask everybody to give us a nice differential, and not only differential, but but what do we do? How do we approach this? Mm-hmm. So we did a white blood cell count. <laughs> And the white blood cell count was elevated at 14,000. Wow. And um, 30% eosinophils. 30%? Made us think of parasites. E- my goodness, how surprising. And uh, his, but, you know, chemistries looked fine. Um, his muscle enzymes were elevated, both his LDH and his CK. There you go. So elevated muscle enzymes, it's elevated white kinase, count. by the way, for those that want to know. Yes. This what? Creatine kinase. Creatine kinase is CK. What's a normal white blood count? Um, less than 10,000. Yeah, with 2% eosinophils at most. Um, <laughs> did you do any cardiac studies? 
So at this point, this is all you're getting. Okay, fine. That's all you, that's all you get. That's, that's all you plenty. get. You don't get yeah, anything I else. think that's a good amount. That is plenty. I have two emails to read. All right? Please do. And the first one is quite interesting. It is from John. Listen, Dixon. I know you don't... Stop, stop thinking about the uh, case. No, I'm looking at the hawks. There are hawks out though. today, yeah. There are lots of them. Here. The rain flushed out the uh, rats. <laughs> that's what it did. From their lairs. Exactly right. John writes, greetings TWIP trio from Creighton University in Omaha, Nebraska. Greetings. The weather here is unusually mild for February <laughs> with a current high of 8C. Yeah. I'm teaching parasitology this semester, wow. and I enjoy playing the case studies while the students are in the lab. Great. I like to have them guess the answer. <laughs> she pl- he plays the podcast while they're having lab. Isn't that cool? That's amazing. So far, they're doing fairly well, so keep those case studies coming. Last week, I had them listen to TWIP 102 and ask them a few questions about the paper regarding eosinophils supporting trichinella growth. That's the IL-17 paper? Yeah. Right? I also had each of them formulate a question for you. I won't overwhelm you with all 16 questions, but here are two I found particularly interesting. One, how does the parasite react slash adapt to low nutrient, low glucose situations within the host? Does it die or does its behavior change? I think what we saw from that paper is it actually has the ability to extract glucose yes. as a glucose transporter. So what it's, it's highly upregulating. Yeah, so it's actually upregulating and it's getting the glucose that it needs. Yeah, at the expense of the host. Yep. Well, everybody- but remember... Uh, it was the GLUT1 transporter, okay. you remember from the paper? But this parasite actually uh, is surrounded by a circulatory ready, which brings it uh, right. venous supply blood. So this is oxygen poor, and it should also be glucose poor. Because the host has already extracted its meal from the blood before it gets to the venous return. So this parasite is dealing with a nutrient-poor blood supply to begin with. So it has to have a number of upregulated uh, GLUT4 uh, mm-hmm. transporters in order to just stay even with the game here, I think. So All right. that's how that works. All right. Second question. I would like to ask the trip <laughs> TWIP trio. <laughs> it's a tough one. If yeah. a larger increase in cellular oxygen availability would outcompete the increase in <laughs> glycogen storage to prevent transformation from aerobic to anaerobic cycles in the muscle cells, if the worm is unable to rely on the increase of glycogen storage within the muscle cell, would it then die? That's a great question. Um, I'm not sure you can overwhelm an anaerobic system with the venous return. I think the the cells on the on the capillary side of the circulation would benefit from an increased mm-hmm. glucose supply or oxygen supply, but I don't think it would uh, survive going through the capillary beds to come out on the other side, and that's where the parasite lives on the other side of that uh, uh, oxygen barrier, so to speak, the tissue side. So, I think it would do fine. Because it's disarmed yeah. all of the mitochondria inside the nurse cell. Mm-hmm. So there's no aerobic possibilities. All right. Uh, thanks again for your time. and Yeah, keep listening. To dedication to TWIP. We really appreciate your work. P.S. One of the students asked me if you guys get paid for doing TWIP. We do. I just laughed. <laughs> just I'm not waiting. in money. No, just no, not no. In money. We get paid, and I'm waiting for the check to come because Vincent, every time I come into work, Vincent says the check is in the mail. And I keep looking at him, mm-hmm. and I say, it is? Okay, I'll go home the next night. And no, the answer is, of course, we don't. No, we don't get paid. We just do this out of love. And we don't want to get paid. A love for the subject and love for teaching you guys out there who are exactly listening. Right. For sure. Yeah. I, agree. I just think it, teaching is one of the most uh, satisfying things totally. you can do. The uh, last one is from Varun. This is actually a guest to last week's case, a little bit late, but <laughs> he says, hope I'm not late for my diagnosis. Based on the set of <laughs> symptoms presented, as Dixon pointed out, I would first rule out a TB, it's a possible co-infection, prefer a gene expert assay, and a sputum culture as a screening test. Nice. Considering that we are looking only at parasitic possibility for now, I'm ignoring other sets of microbes. Don't do that. <laughs> you get fooled one day. Yeah. In India, I can affirm that a person will come to clinic only if that person is really suffering <laughs> here, here. and is especially the case if they have poor economic conditions. So I believe that the patient in question has frequent hemoptysis. I would suggest a sputum wet mount, though lung biopsy is recommended in some cases. It doesn't seem necessary at this point. The case appears to me like that of P. Westermani. I may be wrong. Treat with praziquantel. You nailed it. 
No, remember this was oh. the woman with uh, from Calcutta with the yeah. cyst. cyst. And so yeah, it was cyst. Echinococcus. Oh, Echinococcus. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Yeah, I'm sorry. And, the, and the clue there, right, is I think I threw it, was it was a salty. The sputum was salty. Well, it, was, it wasn't hemoptysis after all. It you know, it's was... interesting. They describe, if you actually ask patients, oh, I coughed up blood, and I think I mentioned it, just a little bit of blood is, yeah. you know, they're going to talk about it for a month. But, the, you know, I, I'd seen that a couple times, this yeah. salty sputum. And I looked through the literature, and yeah, actually, there's something about the tonicity of the contents that gets coughed up when these erode into the bronchi mm-hmm. and uh, the salty sputum is kind of a classic thing. Oh, so. interesting. Uh, Varun is from, oh, he says, I keep twipping. I Bangalore. won't miss Twix shows for any reason. Very good. Uh, I can think of one reason, but we won't mention it. <laughs> Varun is from the Department of Neuromicrobiology yeah. in Bangalore. Now, neuromicro- neuromicrobiology, what an interesting That's department. That's a fantastic subspecialty, isn't it? <laughs> You've been to Bangalore? I have. And yeah. how far is it from Kolkata? It's quite a bit of a ways away. It's up up at the northeastern portion of, uh, western portion of India, and Calcutta is down at the southwest. Kolkata. Southeastern. Let's say so, it properly. Let's respect southeast. their country and say it properly. <laughs> well, I had two visitors here <laughs> today from Calcutta. Calcutta. Kol- Kolkata? Kolkata. Yeah, Kolkata. By the way, he mentions TB. And I, I was at a... I heard a talk, and then I had subsequently had this fellow on a podcast from Safayed, the company. You must know mm-hmm. Safayed. Yes. They make these cartridges that you put a sample in, you put the cartridge in the machine, and then it reports to you. It's a PCR, basically. It's a whole PCR reaction in a cartridge. You don't have to do anything. Mm-hmm. And so for, for TB, they go around, for example, uh, in South Africa, they go around to the mines, and they get the workers to come out, and all they do is spit into it, and they put it in this cartridge. It's on a truck, and then it beams up the results to a central lab, wow. and they can see who's TB positive. That's incredible. And they can go all over, and it, it, they, you That's can buy a cartridge for flu, for anything you want. Oh, my gosh, this That's is amazing. just brilliant. That's amazing. No, no pipetting, no cycling. It's all one machine, Cephaid. Mm-hmm. And um, wow. I had him on, on TWIM. It was really, really cool. Has brought that up. Anyway, that's TWIP 104, guys. We're moving on. We are. And uh, you can find TWIP at iTunes and also at microbe.tv slash TWIP. And we would love to get your guesses for the case study or any email you would like, uh, supporting or not supporting Dixon, if you wish. <laughs> <laughs> Wait a minute. I just love bugging you. You, know, you, can, you should support okay. Dixon. As long Twip, as I keep laughing, Twip you're at okay. micro- you, I've learned that you laugh pretty much all I the do. time. Yeah, I do. And there's nothing I can do to I not like make laughing. you laugh, so uh, that's good. You have survived the onslaught. Yeah. It's easy sailing from now on. You think? <laughs> Twip at microbe.tv. And Daniel Griffin here, who is just wonderful at these case presentations. Thank you, Daniel. Oh, thank you. If you want to find Daniel, you come to Columbia University Medical Center. He shows you the guy with the bow tie. <laughs> on the but days. it's a specific bow tie depending on the day. Yeah, the days he goes to see patients, he wears a bow tie. Today the we're days. looking at a bow tie with, looks like DNA molecules yeah, DNA. and well, other RNA. things. Well, they're RNA. If you look close, those are used. <laughs> well, those are RNA. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So it's got eight little RNA segments. It's influenza. You got it. Yes. How you know, about uh, that? D- Dixon, if there were seven different kinds of genome on it, what would that be? That would be the David Baltimore schema. Very good. <laughs> Very good. You get a free pen. Oh, you're so generous. <laughs> I don't actually think I've ever seen you writing. I like to type on my computer. I don't write much. All right. Uh, anyway, today you saw patients. That's why you have a bow tie. And I got to head back soon. And when you're not seeing patients, you wear then T-shirts. Then I wear blue jeans and T-shirts. Then he's <laughs> sailing. He's not sailing. He's not wearing a tie. Dixon de Pommier is also here, but you can find him at his most famous website, trickinella.org, and also verticalfarm.com. He is the father of the vertical farm. He gives birth to new ones every week. <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, the gestation period is uh, only a week for a vertical farm, right, Dixon? Thank you, Dixon. You're welcome. I used to bend over to talk into the mic. Yeah. Well, I'm, you know, I don't want to <laughs> breathe heavily. <laughs> Michael Libman. Michael Libman. My, sorry, I, I, to speak over you. People don't like that when, you, when we do that. I'll cut it out. Michael Libman was our guest today from McGill University. He's also at the Center for Tropical Diseases, which seems funny in Montreal, doesn't it? <laughs> doesn't it? <laughs> it really is funny. because <laughs> People it, do travel. In the winter, it's very cold there, although in the summer, it's also it's very hot. It's the best hot. time for these patients to come back, though, because they take a winter yeah, vacation and they go to the tropics. I understand, but it is, seems a little bit incongruous. Anyway, we thank Michael, and we hope he will come back 
I'm Vincent Racaniello. You can find me at virology.ws. Oh, I wanted to ask you something, Daniel. Yes. So a case of Zika, they isolated the entire viral genome sequence from amniotic fluid. This was a woman who in the first trimester had symptoms of rash and muscle okay. aches, consistent with Zika, but didn't have a diagnosis. And then the fetus was found to be microcephalic by sonography later in pregnancy, and they got the viral genome from amniotic fluid. Okay. However, at that point, her serum was negative for Zika IgM. Okay. So this is going from first to last trimester of pregnancy. It, yeah. Would IgM go away that quickly? Um, it can. And actually, really? that's... Um, the. The time, it, it varies on different pathogens. Hmm. Um, some pathogens, your IG, IgM stays positive for a while. Um, classically, we talk about IgM starting to wane after, we'll say, six months. And so, yeah, it, it may have waned, actually. I, you know, and different pathogens. I noticed with, um, we had a lot of West Nile when hmm. I, was, uh, hmm. I was practicing during the big outbreak in Colorado. And uh, for some reason, those IgMs seemed to go away um, more quickly than others. It's interesting. I saw an article yesterday uh, saying that in some cases, I, uh, West Nile IgM can persist for a year, but I suspect there's something weird going on there. Yeah. But why wouldn't they look for IG, IgG then? That would be my thing right? to look for next. Um, would you just do first IgM to see if it's an, a new infection and then look for IgG? If, if you, you know, a lot of times we do both and all Yeah, right, right, right. I would think so. Um, I so. wanted to get your thoughts on that. Okay. Now, we are talking a lot about Zika on TWIV. Yes. As you might ima imagine. So it's very interesting. And uh, yeah, the Zika is, you know, even though we're on, here on TWIP, um, you know, what a what a scenario. So let's have the World Cup soccer <laughs> right, in right, right. one country. We'll bring everybody and every disease from the world to a country. And then we'll wait a couple of years till those diseases have a chance to propagate. Right. And then right. let's have the Olympics so we can then spread bring some out. people and spread everything back yeah, around yeah. the world. So this is, I'm not sure who planned this. <laughs> well, the, it's, uh, the thing is, that's the key. You've got huge numbers of people moving around more so than ever, right? People, fly, people come to countries the and visit was, more so than ever. An event like the World Cup brings millions of people, would you say? Millions? Millions, at least. I didn't go. No, no, I didn't. So I didn't bring Zika there. I understand that our women's soccer team actually dropped out. Of what? The Olympics, as a result of well, this uh, and Maybe some of them are planning to get pregnant, right? Hey, well. Although, if they're not, they shouldn't have dropped out, exactly. right? Exactly. I don't understand that. Yeah. The, really? The women's soccer team dropped That's out? That's what I was told. Oh, dear. It's unfortunate. <laughs> I hope not. I'm a huge fan of Olympic women's soccer. It's great. Yeah. A very good team. It's fun. How about volleyball? Are Same problem. I don't know. I don't have any information. So, we, so is, about the is Jimmy Carter going to withdraw the Olympic team from, from going? You know, he Are got we, better, by the way. Yes, he did. I'm glad. Yes, he did. All right. I told you where I'm from, and I want to tell you that we have music at the beginning and end, and uh, it's composed and performed by Ronald Jenkins, who lets us use it. And I emailed him, and he said, yeah, absolutely. I, I support educational efforts, and he gets a thrill when people go and buy his music on his website, which is ronaldjenkins.com, and they say, I came from TWIP. <laughs> and he says, that's cool. We send people. All right. We use it with his permission. You've been listening to This Week in Parasitism. We do thank you for joining us. All three of us, in fact, thank you, right? We do. Thank you yes. for joining us. And we'll be back probably in another two weeks, I guess, right? I hope so. Good app. Or I should say we'll be back soon. Another twip is parasitic. parasitic. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>